Alxosaurus is a therizinosaur, which were long-necked manoraptorans with leaf-shaped teeth, large hand claws, and broad feet with four toes. There is evidence of how therizinosaurs lived, but it is likely that they used their hand claws to help hook leafy branches and stems in order to pull them closer to their mouth. The claws may also have been used in self-defense. A full skull of Alxosaurus has never been found, but its lower jaw had a down-curved tip. Other therizinosaurs also had beaked jaw tips and may also have had cheek teeth at the back of the mouth. Ornithomimus was the first of the ornithomimsaurs to be named, giving the group its name, which means bird mimic lizards. It was initially identified from just a hand and a foot, but is now known from many specimens, like its close relatives Struthiomimus and Gallimimus. It had a toothless beak and enormous eyes. In 2001, it was noted that vertical ridges on the beak's inner surface looked similar to structures used by ducks to filter food particles from water. However, these structures are also seen in other beaked animals that do not feed in this way. Struthiomimus is one of several closely related ornithomimsaurs. The first specimen was discovered in Alberta, and consisted of only pelvic and hind limb fragments. However, a far superior specimen, missing only the end of the tail and the skull roof, was discovered later on. It would have looked similar to Ornithomimus but had a longer body and tail and shorter hind limbs, its hands and hand claws were particularly long, and its thumbs did not oppose its fingers, reducing its grasping ability. Gallimimus is one of the biggest and best known ornithomimsaurs, Dinaeurus was even bigger. It was originally thought to have a snout that curved upwards at its tip, but recent evidence suggests that it actually had a broad and blunt snout tip. Its lower jaw was deeper and shorter than that of other ornithomimsaurs. Gallimimus had proportionately shorter arms, smaller hands, and shorter hand claws than other members of this group, which suggests that it used its forelimbs differently to other ornithomimsaurs. It might have raked the ground to uncover food. Kairos notes was a large North Am. Arican oviraptorosaur with a long skull and deep, rounded crest located over the top of its head. Its lower jaw was long and shallow, with an upturned, shovel-shaped tip, two tooth-like prongs projected from the middle of the palate, but there were no true teeth. The claw on its second finger was straight in contrast to the curved finger shown on other oviraptosaurs. Ingenia was a toothless oviraptorosaurs with a short rounded skull. Compared to those of its close relatives, its arms were particularly short and its hands were stout and strong, while its first finger was much larger than than other two. Also, its tail was deeper than that of other oviraptorosaurs. These unusual features all suggest that Ingenia was doing something quite different to its relatives, but its habits and lifestyle remain a mystery. However, like all oviraptorosaurs, it was feathered and bird-like. Despite being a theropod dinosaur, which were typically carnivores, Caudipteryx used its large beak to eat plants and seeds, although it may have taken small animal and insect prey as well. Unlike other theropods, it did not have a bony crest on the top of its head. A number of complete fossils of this dinosaur have been found, giving us a good idea of how it looked. The abundance of remains also suggest that Caudipteryx was a common animal. Dromaeosaurus was the first dromaeosaurid to be described. Ironically, however, it remains one of the most poorly known members of the group, and only a partial skull and a few bones from the hand and foot have been described. The skull was deep and broad for a dromaeosaurid, and the teeth at the tip of the upper jaw were wide. 
the lower jaw was also deep and robust compared to the far more shallow lower jaws of Dromaeosaurids such as Velociraptor. These features suggest that Dromaeosaurus had a more powerful bite than the Dromaeosaurid species. Truden was named for just a single tooth, but we now know that skull and skeletal material originally named Stenonychosaurus belonged to Truden. Its teeth were coarsely serrated, so much so that it might have suggested that it might have been able to shred leaves. It was probably mostly predatory, however, and could have preyed on animals ranging. From small lizards and mammals to medium-sized ornithischians, in some places, large numbers of Truden teeth are preserved alongside the bones of baby hadrosaurs. It might be that Truden stayed close to hadrosaur colonies during the nesting season, grabbing unguarded young when it could. It had large eyes and probably had well-developed binocular vision. Although often described as a brainy dinosaur, its brain was proportionally about as big as that of an ostrich or emu. The bowl-shaped nests, eggs, and even some Truden embryos have been discovered, as have preserved adults sitting on top of nests. When named in 1969, Deinonychus was used to promote the idea that dinosaurs were not slow and cumbersome animals destined for extinction, but successful, often agile, and perhaps even warm-blooded. Its long fingers were equipped with three large curved claws. Like other Manoraptorans, Deinonychus was almost certainly feathered, and long feathers called rectrices must have grown from the upper surfaces of its hands and second fingers. Velociraptor was discovered in the Gobi Desert during the 1920s and has become one of the most familiar dromaeosaurids. Its snout was long and narrow, with a concave upper border. Like other dromaeosaurids, Velociraptor had long bands, an enlarged claw on its second toe, and a fairly stiff but lightly built tail. One spectacularly complete specimen is preserved locked in combat with Protoceratops. Thanks to this and other specimens, we now know Velociraptor's anatomy in detail. However, there's no evidence it hunted in pack. This small, feathered dinosaur from China is related to the previous Velociraptor and other dromaeosaurs. However, unlike those speedy runners, Microraptor was more at home in the trees, gliding from branch to branch. It spent most of its time hunting small prey, such as lizards and early mammals, and used its aerobatic skills to avoid predators. It did not fly, but glided like modern flying squirrels. Its feathered arms acted as glide surfaces, and its legs may have helped steer the animal through the air. It was not a direct ancestor of birds, but its lifestyle. Le suggests a form of locomotion that may have been the forerunner of powered flight in birds. One of the largest known sauropods, Argentinosaurus was probably a primitive member of the group. Its broad vertebrae had small, peg and socket articulations that were located just above the spinal cord opening. Peg and socket structures were common in Sauriscians, and probably kept the animal's backbones rigid. These spinal features were absent in later titanosaurs, but it is unknown why they evolved more flexible backbones. Argentinosaurus's immense ribs were hollow, cylindrical tubes. Amargosaurus was an unusual-looking sauropod. It was relatively small and short-necked, 
with pairs of long spikes that projected from the top of its 12 neck vertebrae. The function of these spikes is as yet unknown. Amargosaurus may fed on ground level vegetation, while taller sauropods foraged for foliage higher up. Only the skull of the Mongolian sauropod Nemagetosaurus has ever been found. At first glance, it resembles that of the Jurassic Diplodocid Decreosaurus, and as a result Nemagetosaurus was originally thought to be a late surviving Diplodocid. More recent work, however, has shown that it was actually a Titanosaur, and therefore more closely related to animals such as Saltosaurus. While some Titanosaurs had stout, spoon-shaped teeth and a short skull, it had pencil-shaped teeth and a long snout. Some experts have reconstructed the dinosaur's head showing a rounded, bony hump on the top of its skull. If such a hump had existed, its head would have looked very much like a brachiosaurus. However, it was more likely to have been low and subtle. The most recent studies show that the back of the skull was very tall compared to the snout, and that the whole skull was long and boxy. Saltosaurus is one of the best known on of the titanosaurs. These were a group of sauropods traditionally thought to have been mostly restricted to southern hemisphere but now known to have been more widespread. Unlike other sauropods, some titanosaurs were armored. Saltosaurus was one of the first titanosaurs found that demonstrate this. The upper surface and sides of its body were covered with large, oval armor plates, some of which may have been tipped with spikes. Thousands of smaller, rounded bones covered the skin between the large plates, as was the case in most other titanosaurs, it had very broad hips and its body would have been wide and rounded, its limbs were stout and it had a flexible tail. Minmi is unique in having strange extra bones, called paravertebrae, along its back. These might have helped provide increased support for its back muscles. Small, rounded armor plates covered its body, including its belly. One specimen includes a skull that is broad and deep, with a short, narrow snout and large eye sockets. Another specimen provides direct evidence of its diet, preserved gut contents show that it ate fruit. It is also proposed that it could be a good swimmer and spend lots of time in water. Gastonia is one of the world's best known ankylosaurs, and most parts of its skeleton have been discovered. Its skull was shallow and broad with a wide, square-tipped beak. As in nearly all ankylosaurs, its teeth were small and leaf-shaped, the bones forming the roof of the skull were thickened and domed, and a special joint around the bones that housed the brain may have provided a shock-absorbing function. Some experts speculate that these dinosaurs butted heads together when fighting. Sauropelta was a large, long-tailed, North American notosaurid, thanks to a well-preserved specimen that includes a near-complete skull. Its anatomy is remarkably well-known. Sauropelta had more teeth in its lower jaw than most other notosaurids. The back of the skull was much broader than the snout, and the top of the skull was flat. The upper surfaces of its body and tail were covered in oval bone plates that formed a continuous armor covering long, conical spikes projected upward and sideways from its neck and shoulders. Its relatively long tail was made up of more than 40 vertebrae. The largest of the ankylosaurids, Ankylosaurus was a giant, club-tailed animal with large, triangular horn at the back of its skull. Its snout was short and broad, small, leaf-shaped teeth lined the sides of its jaws, and at the front its toothless beak was broad and deep. The sides of the snout appeared to bugle outward, and the nostrils were directed sideways. It was very similar to its closest relative, Euplocephalus. Edmontonia was one of the largest and most widely distributed notosaurids. One excellent specimen has allowed a good understanding of its anatomy and appearance. Bands of armor plates covered the upper surface of the neck and shoulder region, and smaller plates covered the rest of the back and tail. Several long spikes projected from each shoulder. The first two spikes pointed diagonally forward, and the two farther back pointed sideways. Its skull had a long, low snout and its eye sockets were placed far back.
Euplocephalus is one of the largest and best known of the ankylosaurids. Specimens have been found with almost all their thick plates of studded armor in place. It was closely related to Ankylosaurus, and shared many of the same characteristics, the low-slung body that it must have been almost round in cross-section, the limbs were short and stocky, and only three toes, tipped with blunt hooves, were present on each hind foot. Other ankylosaurs had four toes, the vertebrae at the end of the tail were fused to form a stiffened, rod-like structure that helped to support the large, rounded club at the tip of the tail. The club was formed of four bony plates, held off the ground, and probably used in defense against predators. The base of the tail was almost certainly flexible enough to allow sideways movement, and the tail would have been quite muscular. Euplocephalus was a herbivore, probably even digging up roots and tubers. Remains are usually found singly, but the discovery of 22 young Euplocephalus has raised the possibility that they may have lived in herds. One of the most famous ornithopods, Iguanodon is best known for the many near-complete skeletons found in a Belgian coal mine. These were originally reconstructed standing upright in a kangaroo-style posture. However, it is now thought that it walked mainly on all fours, with its body and tail held parallel to the ground. Its arms were long and robust, and well adapted for bearing its weight. In its hands, the middle three fingers were joined together, the fifth finger could curl to grasp food and the thumb was armed with a vicious spike. Aranosaurus was discovered was discovered in the desert in Niger during the 1960s, and has become one of the most famous ornithopods, this is due to the remarkably tall bony spines that grew upward from the vertebrae on its back, in life, these would have been embedded in a sail formed of muscle and skin, the function of this sail is unknown but it may have been used in display or in controlling body temperature. Many other unrelated dinosaurs, such as the giant theropod Spinosaurus, had similar sail. Small rounded horns in front of its eyes made Aranosaurus the only known horn ornithopod. Lee Elinosaura is one of several small ornithopods known from a famous fossil site in Victoria, Australia, called Dinosaur Cove. When it was alive, southern Australia was within the Antarctic Circle, and although the polar regions were less cold than they are today, it would have been continually dark for several months a year. An internal cast of Lee Elinosaura's brain case shows that it had large optic lobes. The parts of the brain associated with eyesight, so it probably had large eyes and good sight for seeing in the dark. One of the best-known small ornithopods, Hypsilophodon is known from several near-complete skeletons. At one time, the misconception that it had grasping hands and a first toe that was directed backward led some to think that it was a tree climber. In fact, its rigid tail and long hind limbs and feet show that it was a fast-running ground animal. Leaf-shaped teeth show that, like other small ornithopods, it browsed on low-growing plants. Pointed teeth were present at the front of the upper jaw, and the beaked jaw tips were pointed. Tenontosaurus was a large and particularly long-tailed iguanodontian. Its long forelimbs and short, broad hands suggest that it walked on all fours, although it was probably able to rear on its back legs when feeding or fighting. Its skull was deep and its nostril openings were long. Two species are known. In one, the front of the upper jaw was toothless, but in the other, teeth were present in the same region. The outer rim of the beak at the tip of the lower jaw was serrated. It is best known for having been discovered alongside remains of the theropod Deinonychus. This probably shows that the theropod preyed on Tenontosaurus. Groups of juvenile specimens have been discovered at two different locations, which suggests that young animals remained in groups after hatching. Mutaburosaurus was a large iguanodon-like ornithopod with a deep bony bump on the top surface of its snout. The skull bones beneath its eye sockets were thick and strong. Some experts have suggested that these bones might show that it was adapted for biting and chewing especially tough plants. It was thought to be related to iguanodon. A spike-shaped bone was thought to be a thumb spike like that of iguanodon. 
However, more recent studies have shown that Muttaburosaurus was a far older species. One of the largest and best known of duck-billed dinosaurs, Edmontosaurus lived in North America during the late Cretaceous, a crestless hadrosaur. He bones at the front of its long jaws flared out sideways, forming a duck-like bill that was used to grab and crop large mouthfuls of vegetation. In fact, the term duck-billed dinosaur was originally coined for this species, as in other hadrosaurs, the jaw tips of Edmontosaurus were toothless, and its hundreds of teeth were arranged in tightly filled batteries on both upper and lower jaws. Huge, hollow areas surrounded the nostril openings. The function of these hollows is unknown, but they might have housed balloon-like sacs that the animal could inflate at will. These facial balloons would have enabled Edmontosaurus to make sounds, which may have been used to attract mates, signal to other members of the herd, or threaten rivals. Brachylophosaurus had a flattened, sheet-like crest that grew backward from the snout, overhanging the back of the skull. An excellent Brachylophosaurus canadensis specimen was found in Alberta, after which it is named. Some individuals, presumably the males, were more heavily built than others, with deeper, lower jaws, stouter skulls, and wider crests that extended farther along the skull. In 2000, an exceptionally complete specimen was discovered in Montana. It is covered in large amoon. T.S. of preserved skin, and promises to provide much information on the appearance of this dinosaur. Mayasaura became world famous thanks to the discovery of nests, eggshell fragments, and the remains of juveniles, all found alongside the skeletons of adults. As suggested by the generic name, which means good mother lizard, the remains indicate that Mayasaura formed nesting colonies, with parents constructing crater-shaped nests in which the hatchlings stayed for an extended period, being fed and looked after by their parents. It is possible that these behavioral traits were true of all hadrosaurids, its skull possessed an expanded bill and a solid crest that extended across the top of the skull above the eyes. Several views have been proposed on the lineage of Mayasaura, but it shares some features with Brachylophosaurus, and the two appear to be close relatives. This most remarkable hadrosaurid is famous for the tubular crest on the back of its skull. As was the case in all Lamiosaurini, Parasaurolophus's crest was hollow and contained complex internal passages. The chambers within the crest may have been used in making deep, resonating calls, Parasaurolophus was a particularly heavily built hadrosaurid, with shorter, stouter limbs than most other kinds. Its particularly large shoulder and hip girdles show that it had large, powerful muscles. These features suggest to some experts that it was an inhabitant of deep forests, where it pushed its way through undergrowth. Several species of Parasaurolophus are known, and they differ in length and shape of the crest. Lamiosaurus was a large Lamiosaurini that had a tall, rectangular crest extending forward, overhanging the snout. It also possessed a shortened cheek region and a tall ridge along its backbone. Crest size and shape is variable in Lamiosaurus specimens, and as a result several species have been recognized. While some are probably distinct species, others might be males, females or juveniles of one species, in Lamiosaurus lambae. The crest had a rectangular front portion that pointed upward, and a spike at the back that was directed upward and backward. Lamiosaurus clavinitialis had a much shorter spike at the back and might be the female of the first species. In Lamiosaurus manacrostatus, there was no posterior spike, and the crest blade was large. Skin impressions show that small, non-overlapping nodule-like scales covered the dinosaur, and it seems to have lacked the large conical tubercles present on the underside of Corythosaurus. One of the hook-nosed hadrosaurines, Griposaurus and its relatives had forelimbs that were about two-thirds the length of the hind limbs. Unlike most hadrosaurids, which had forelimbs that were about half as long as the hind limbs, why these hadrosaurids had such long arms is unknown, 
but it is likely that this adaptation allowed them to feed from higher up in the vegetation than the other herbivores that shared their environment. The best known Griposaurus species is Griposaurus notabilis, the bones that formed the upper surface of its snout arched upward, and a large depression s. Arounded the nostril, this enlarged nasal region may have been brightly colored and used in display or to shove against rivals in disputes. Corythosaurus was known for its hollow, plate-like crest, and was most closely related to Velafrons from Mexico, Nipponosaurus from Russia and Hypacrosaurus from the USA. Together, these hadrosaurids are known as the fan-crested Lamiosaurines. Corythosaurus was a large dinosaur with tall spines in a ridge along its back. Its snout was shallow and delicate compared to that of many other hadrosaurids, suggesting that it may have been a more selective feeder that browsed for the juiciest fruits and youngest leaves. Much is known about Corythosaurus, because several complete specimens have been found, some even have preserved skin impressions, which show that it had lines of conical tubercles along its underside and a continuous skin frill along the top of its backbone. The frill was attached to the rear of the head crest and was deepest in the gap between the shoulders and the back of the head. Cetacosaurus is one of the earliest members of Ceratopsia, the horned dinosaur group, it is also one of the best-known Mesozoic dinosaurs owing to the number of specimens that have been discovered. This has enabled experts to identify 14 species according to skull shape, although not all experts agree with the classifications. Unlike later Ceratopsians, it was probably bipedal. It had four-fingered hands and long hind limbs. Its short, deep skull had a narrow, toothless beak, which gave Cetacosaurus its name, meaning parrot lizard, Horn-like bony growths projected sideways from the cheeks, and differed in size and shape between the species. Young specimens have also been discovered. In one case, dozens of young were preserved along with the remains of an adult. One specimen was found with numerous long filaments growing from the upper surface of its tail. Nothing like this has been seen in any other specimens, and the function of these bizarre structures remains a mystery. One of the best known of all dinosaurs, Triceratops is familiar to most people, with its large neck frill, two long brow horns, and a short nose horn, the neck frill lacked the large openings that were normally pres. And in that of most honed dinosaurs small triangular bones lined the edges of some frills but these were absent in many specimens injuries preserved on skulls show that individuals sometimes fought among themselves perhaps over mates or territory some specimens preserve bite marks made by Tyrannosaurus and one Triceratops even seems to have had one of its brow horns snapped off by a Tyrannosaur about 15 Triceratops species have been named over the Ursal of which were distinguished on the basis of differences now seem to represent the sort of variation seen among individuals of the same species and only two species are currently recognized. One of the most studied of all primitive ceratopsians Protoceratops is known from many specimens collected in the Mongolian Gobi Desert some specimens have taller frill and deeper snouts than others which may represent a difference between the sexes Protoceratops most likely dug burrows where they had their young. One group of juvenile specimens was found preserved together in a burrow in the sand in 2001 a new species Protoceratops helenicorinosvos named unlike the first species Protoceratops andrusiate had two parallel nasal hornslack teeth at the front of the upper jawand its frill was orientated farther forward. Pentaceratops was a large chasmosaurini and a close relative of Chasmosaurus the name of this dinosaur means five-horned face and reflects the particularly long horns that projected sideways from its cheeks it had a deep snout long brow horns and an extremely tall frill above the neck six tongue-shaped bones were arranged around the frill border and an additional smaller pair was present either side of the midline. 
Chasmosaurus had a relatively long snout and a long broad frill that contained two large holes conical bones were arranged around the sides of the frill although not along the rear border some species such as Chasmosaurus ervinans as the most recently identified species lacked brow horns entirely while in other species they were very long Chasmosaurus bellisome individuals had short stubby brow horns while others had long curved ones. S, greater than the shape of the nose horn was also variable between the species and some it was tall and obviously curved while in others it was short broad and blunt. Styracosaurus was a Centrosaurini ceratopsid closely related to Centrosaurus and best distinguished from it by a remarkable array of six long spikes that projected upward and outward from the back of the neck frill these spikes, the longest of which was 57 centimeters, made Styracosaurus's skull an impressive one, 8 meters long it had a shortish blunt nasal horn and interestingly only juveniles possessed brow horns adult Styracosaurs had crater-like depressions over their eye sand it seems that the brow horns were reabsorbed as the animal matured the bones of many individuals have been found together so this animal probably lived in herds. Ineosaurus was named in 1995 like today's bison these animals seem to have lived in herds but they also had a curved horn on the snout so the full name of the one species Ineosaurus procurvicornis translates as buffalo lizard with forward curving horn the nasal horn of Ineosaurus was unique being flattened from side to side and with a tip that curved over the end of the snout in young animals the horn was short and erect and as the animal matured it curved forward like most other members of the Centrosaurini group Ineosaurus laced brow horns and had either small lumps or rounded pits in their place the margins of its frill were wavy odd two long spikes projected upward from the frill's upper border these spikes were straightened it is difficult to imagine how they might have functioned in combat. Pachycephalosaurus was the biggest of the Pachycephalosaurs it is best known from a single 60 cm long domed skull it had large eyes which suggests it had good vision and small teeth indicating it was either a herbivore or an omnivore two other North American Pachycephalosaurs lived at the same time as Pachycephalosaurus Stygimoloch and Dracorex both had smaller domes and larger horns than Pachycephalosaurus however some experts think that all these animals simply represent different growth stages of the same species. Time equals 0.5 s, greater than Stegoceras is one of the best known of the Pachycephalosaurs. A prominent bony shelf decorated with bony knobs and spikes projected from the back of its domed skull roof. It had a short face and, while its snout was narrow, its cheeks flared out. Its small, coarsely serrated teeth were most likely used in chewing and shredding leaves. Two species previously thought to belong to Stegoceras have recently been reclassified to separate genera. Confuciusurni is one of the best-known Mesozoic birds and hundreds of specimens have been discovered. In contrast to Archaeopteryx and other more primitive birds, it was entirely toothless. It was also unusual in having a robust, bony bar right behind the eye, an exceptionally large curved thumb that Confuciusurni preyed on aquatic animals. Its bill shape and hind limbs have been compared to those of modern kingfishers. Originally described from a single, headless skeleton, Iberomesserni was a small, finch-sized Cretaceous bird. It is one of the most primitive members known of the entirely Cretaceous bird group known as the Enantiornithines, or opposite birds. They were closer to modern birds than they were to primitive species in that they had shortened tails and large chest bones. However, like the much older Archaeopteryx, they had teeth. Gansus was an amphibious diving bird with large feet, 
fossilized skin impressions show that its feet webbed all the way to the tips of the toes, so Gansu's was probably similar to modern loons and grebes in its diving ability. Unfortunately, its skull remains unknown so its feeding behavior is still a mystery. It does not have any close relatives. However, its features suggest that it was an early member of Ornithora, the group that includes later Cretaceous forms, as well as all modern birds. Hesperonis was a large, flightless seabird with tiny wings, massive feet, and a toothed bill. First named in the 1870s, it is the best known member of a group known as the Hesperonithenes, most of which were flightless. The wings and Hesperonis were so small that the hands and even lower arms were absent, and only a small, rod-shaped upper arm bone remained. Th. E legs were placed far back on the body, as they are in modern birds that swim underwater, the toes were long and could close up tightly when the bird was pulling its leg back toward its body while diving. Skin impressions preserved with one specimen show that the toes were not webbed paddles but had large, fleshy lobes projecting from their sides. Ichthyornis is one of the most famous of fossil birds. When originally described, in 1972, it was one of only a handful of Mesozoic birds that seemed to bridge the gap between Archaeopteryx and modern birds. Today, many more Mesozoic birds are known. Studies have shown that Ichthyornis is more closely related to modern birds than were more archaic groups like the Enantiornithines. However, unlike modern birds, it had no teeth. These were small, smooth, and strongly curved, and were well suited for grabbing small and slippery prey, such as fish. Discovered in 1992 on Vega Island in western Antarctica, Vegavis is a relative of Presbiornis, a fossil waterfowl from the Paleocene and Eocene of North America and part of the Enceriform group Anatidae, which includes modern ducks, geese and swans. The significant discovery of Vegavis shows that waterfowl, properly called Enceriforms, were definitely alive during the late Cretaceous. Furthermore, their closest relatives, the gallinaceous birds, or gamebirds, must have been present at this time as well, along with even earlier modern bird groups, such as the Paleognaths, which include ostriches. Compared to many Mesozoic mammals, Vincelestes is known from excellent fossils. Of nine specimens, six include skulls. These show that it had large, stout canine teeth and fewer premolars and molars. It also had a short, deep snout. These features suggest that it was a predator, perhaps preying on smaller mammals, as well as on reptiles and large insects. It was large compared to most Mesozoic mammals, and its length was increased by a very long tail. Repenomamus is one of the most famous of Mesozoic mammals. Whereas most mammal from this time were the size of mice and shrews, it was a giant. In comparison, one species, Repenomamus giganticus, had a skull that was 16 centimeters long and a total body length of about 1 meter long. Its jaws were stoutly constructed, and it was definitely a predator of smaller animals, including baby dinosaurs. It was once thought that Mesozoic mammals were all tiny, scurrying, shrew-like animals. However, new discoveries have shown more diversity than was once thought. Volaticotherium is especially surprising because it was clearly a glider. The only known Mesozoic gliding mammal, large skin membranes stretched between its body and long limbs, and the shapes of its finger and toe bones, and its large claws show that it was a good climber. It was probably an insectivore. Tynolophus is a poorly understood Mesozoic mammal, currently known only from a few partial lower jaw bones. Several jaw features demonstrate that Tynolophus was a monotreme. Sometimes walled egg-laying mammals, the platypus and the echidnas are the only living monotremes and are found only in Australia. It was originally thought to be an early monotreme, only distantly related to the platypus and echidnas. However, work published in 2008 showed that it possessed several features unique to platypuses, but not echidnas. 
Synodelphes is one of the oldest and earliest known members of Metatheria, the mammal group that includes marsupials and all of their fossil relatives, discovered in the Yixian Formation in Jehol, in China. Its fossils have hair preserved around their bodies and limbs. It was small and slender and would have resembled a possum's. It had a slender snout and dainty jaws, and its hands, wrists, ankles, and feet show that it was a good climber. This might indicate that the first Metatherians lived in trees, that Synodelphes is a Metatherian suggests that the split between marsupial and placental mammals, Eutherians, occurred during the early Cretaceous. This is supported by the fact that Aomaya, one of the most primitive Eutherians known, is the same age as Synodelphes. Mouse-sized Aomaya is currently one of the oldest and most primitive member of Eutheria, the mammal group that includes modern placental mammal and their fossil relatives. Its name means Dawn Mother, reflecting its crucial position within our own family tree. The outline of Emoias's body has been preserved. Its bones are surrounded by a thick coat of fur, and its long tail is covered in short hair. Its hands and feet were similar to those of modern climbing mammals, such as opossums and dormice, so it is thought that it clambered about in bushes and trees. Tall, sharp points, or cusps, on its teeth suggest that it was a predator of insects and other small animals. A rat-sized mammal from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia, Zalamdalus is best known for its long, narrow snout and long, slender hind limbs. Its incisors at the tips of its jaws were long and grew continuously throughout its life. In the same way as a modern rodent's front teeth, a gap separated the front teeth from those further back. The tall, pointed teeth suggest Zalamdalus had a diet of insects and perhaps seeds, with its long hind legs and shorter front legs. It is thought that this animal probably hopped like a jerboa.